Human evolution was not the only thing Charles Darwin delayed discussing, and the origin of species was not his only work. In The Descent of Man, Darwin admits to being confounded by how the tendency to produce either an equal amount of females as males or more females than males would be due to natural selection. So he leaves the problem for future scientists to figure out. This concept of sex ratios will be the focus on today's edition of Minute Darwinism. In 1930, Sir Ronald A. Fisher came up with the principle of the one-to-one -one ratio and explains how it comes about through natural selection by discussing parental expenditure. W. D. Hamilton provides a well-accepted explanation as a supplement. Their argument goes like this. Parental expenditure is the investment of parents to their offspring until the offspring are able to be independent. Let's say a parent's tendency to produce males over females is related to the heftier expenditure required to produce females versus males. Imagine a population in which female births are less common than male births. This results in newborn females having better reproductive success than newborn males, since there is an excess of males for the outnumbered females. The parents of the newborn females whose tendency is to produce females will spread their female producing genes. This results in female births becoming more common. The one-to-one -one sex ratio will be approached and the expenditure to produce females and males evens out, as the advantage of producing females becomes less significant. In general, we see this principle mostly holds for populations. Most sex ratios in populations are essentially one-to-one. -one. But what's going on when it doesn't hold? In 1973, Trivers and Willard came up with their own hypothesis for deviations from Fisher's principle, with an explanation also relating to natural selection and parental expenditure. Their argument goes like this. With parental expenditure, let's say that females in good condition can invest more in their offspring than females in poor condition. Let's say that as a result of more investment, these offspring have greater reproductive success. Furthermore, the reproductive benefit from more investment is greater for males than females, since males can exclude the weaker males from reproducing at all, while weaker females can still reproduce with the strong males. In these cases, it is beneficial for sex ratios to deviate from one to one, since it is the evolutionary goal to pass down one's genes. Females in poor condition have better success passing on their genes if they also birth poor conditioned females rather than poor conditioned males. In nature, we see that the trivers willard hypothesis also holds for certain populations, like red deer in Scotland, for example. 46.9% of births by low-ranking deers were to males, while 60.6% of births by high-ranking deers were to males as a result of the deer's competitive mating system. So great, some populations have a one-to-one -one ratio while others deviate from this ratio. The question then becomes, what about humans? If we took the current world population and counted up the males and females, we would find 1.015 males for every female. But this is not actually the ratio that we are interested in. In order to see if there's a tendency for humans to produce more males than females on average, we need to look at the sex ratio at birth. So, rather than counting all the males and females in the world, let us count all the male births and female births that take place in the world. We would find 1.03 males born for every female born. So it's not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio for humans, but it's pretty darn close. Is this indication of the trivers willard hypothesis applicable to humans? Multiple experiments have found that yes, the trivers willard hypothesis can apply to human populations. If this is the case, what factors have been found to affect the sex ratio at birth of human populations? Looking at the well-being of pregnant women and the resulting pregnancies is a logical source to research. One study did just that. Morning sickness is natural for pregnant women. However, hyperemesis gravidarum, or HG for short, is an extreme form of morning sickness that can be deadly. This study looked at data on 1.646 million live births in Sweden. Of these 1.646 million live births, 11.7 thousand were HG cases. The study found that the percentage of girls' birth increased from 48.7% to 56% for HG cases diagnosed in the first two months of pregnancy. With HG as an indication of poor maternal condition and HG cases resulting in a tendency to produce girls, this study supports the trivers willard hypothesis for humans. Besides HG, other sicknesses have been found to be strong predictors for deviations from the one-to-one -one sex ratio at birth as this next study found. Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite that infects about one-third of all humans. 
toxoplasma seroprevalence, or the percentage of a population that has toxoplasma in their blood serum, was measured in 94 countries across Africa, America, Asia, and Europe. The sex ratio at birth for these countries was also recorded. Toxoplasma seroprevalence was found to be one of the strongest predictors of sex ratio at birth. Lower toxoplasma seroprevalence was associated with a greater number of male offspring. But humans are even more complex than animals in the way that our wellness extends past just our physical body. Studies have found that socioeconomic status too can act as a determinant of maternal condition. One study looked at villagers in South Central China, collecting data on a family head's current socioeconomic status and former class identity, and seeing how it affected the proportion of sons in the offspring. As the Trivers Willard hypothesis would predict, the study found that the mean proportion of sons and offspring in current low status families was 0.544, while this proportion was 0.613 for current high status families. The positive correlation between these variables was statistically significant. Families of higher status, in better condition, tend to produce more males. With Fisher's principle and the Trevor's Willard hypothesis explained in terms of parental expenditure, it also makes sense to look at economic expenditure in humans, money, and what money can buy. One study looked at this at a macro level. That is, rather than looking at individual pregnancies or families, it looked at adjusted net disposable income and sex ratio at birth for 23 countries from 1971 through 2013. By looking at changes in disposable income and its effects on sex ratio at birth, they found that a one standard deviation increase in a country's disposable income is associated with an increase of 1.03 male births for every thousand female births. This suggests that even an improvement of an entire population's condition can be correlated with a sex ratio that tends to favor males. So, we have seen that both Fisher's principle and the Trivers Willard hypothesis can apply for both populations of animals and humans. The Trivers Willard hypothesis acting on humans is just another reminder that no matter how advanced we like to think we are, we are still the product of years and years of evolution and natural selection, the same forces that have resulted in the rest of the world's species as well.